Hello and welcome to the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. I'm Mark Rees, and on each episode, I investigate a different, weird, and wonderful subject. And on this episode, we are going to explore some of the crimes committed by the most dastardly of fairy folks, the human-like fairies known for stealing babies and replacing them with something far more sinister. And that is the crafty changelings. More specifically, we are going to focus on the ways in which you can personally detect whether or not your child is yours or some supernatural doppelganger. So, if you've got children who are a little bit strange, this is the episode for you. And so, to begin at the beginning, or rather, once upon a time, because we are going to start this episode with a tale, and all of the best tales start with once upon a time. And once upon a time in the 14th century, there was a witch, or at least a woman who was labelled a witch. And as such, I will refer to her as a witch in this episode, because that's what they do in the original text. But nowadays, I think we might describe her a little bit differently. And this witch lived at Tathin Ur Berkid, or T Thin Ur Berkid, depending on the precise spelling that you're using. It's either Tathin as one word, or T Thin as two words, and then Berkid, or Berkid, is the Welsh for kite, which also happens to be the national bird of Wales, the red kite. And that's my useless fact for the episode. And sadly, it doesn't specify exactly where in Wales this is. But if I had to take an educated guess, and I will take an educated guess, I am assuming it is the farmland area and modern day site of special scientific interest in mould in Flintshire. And this witch in mould in Flintshire was approached one day by a woman in desperate need of her magical assistance. This woman was at her wit's end, and the only person she knew she could turn to was the witch. And she explained that she was the mother of two twins, but the children were, to quote, not getting on. They were not getting on. They were always crying day and night. And so the witch asked one question, which was, are you sure that they are your children? Are you sure that they are your children? Which might seem like quite a delicate question to ask a mother, an even more delicate question to ask a father. But unlike a regular doctor, say, who might ask some more standard questions like, do they have a temperature, maybe? Have they been doing anything else out of the ordinary? This woman, this witch, has un canny powers. And as it turns out, the mother who went to her for help was not offended by this question because she had secretly been thinking exactly the same thing. It wasn't the kind of thing she could just blurt out aloud to her neighbours, but she knew this wise woman might be able to help. And as it turns out, as soon as she ended, the first question was, are you sure they are yours? And with both of them suggesting there was some doubt here that they might not be the woman's own. The witch wonders aloud if somebody or something had switched children with her. Now, the mother says she has no idea. I mean, that, that's, that's why she's talking to the witch, I suppose. If she knew, she wouldn't be there. She has no idea. And further, she has no idea how to find out. I mean, if somebody has switched your children, how can you tell? Well, the witch does indeed have some advice, and she tells her to go and do something rather strange before their eyes and watch what they will say to one another, which is a slightly vague instruction. Do something strange in front of your children. I mean, that, that could mean 
anything. You could paint your entire body blue and, and run around screaming and throwing cake at the wall. That would be strange. Or maybe that's your idea of a good time. If you enjoy painting yourself blue and throwing cake about, please go for it. But this woman does ask the witch for a little bit of clarity. What do you mean by a bit strange? What should I do? So the witch says, well, take an eggshell and proceed to brew beer in it, a chamber aside, and come here, come back to me and tell me what the children say about it. So she tells her to go away and brew beer in an eggshell in front of her children, which is certainly a bit strange, not quite as strange as painting yourself blue and all the other nonsense I just said, but certainly brewing beer in an eggshell would be a strange thing to do, and it's always best not to waste cake. So off she goes back home, and she does exactly what the witch told her to do, and the two children lifted their heads out of the cradle to see what she was doing, to see what this strange woman was now doing. And they watched and they listened, and one said to the other, and the quotes that follow are quite remarkable things for, for young children to be saying. They don't specify exactly how old these two children are, but the fact that they're in a cradle suggests that, you know, that they're, they're not teenagers. And one says to the other, I remember seeing an oak having an acorn, to which the other replied, and I remember seeing a hen having an egg. And the two of them together said, but I do not remember before seeing anyone brew beer in the shell of a hen's egg. And at this point, you might be thinking, never mind the mother, that's an even stranger thing for young children to be saying to each other. And you would be right. What remarkable verse creating skills they have and some telepathic ability to finish off each other's sentences. So that very quickly once more was, I remember seeing an oak having an acorn and I remember seeing a hen having an egg, but I do not remember before seeing anybody brew beer in the shell of a hen's egg. And the woman memorizes this and rushes off back to the witch to tell her. And when she gets there, the witch isn't as surprised as you might assume she would be. In fact, this wise old woman is kind of expecting to hear exactly what this woman said. And she does have some further advice. And what follows next is one of those moments on this podcast that pops up occasionally where I ask you nicely, or rather, I plead with you, I insist, this is old Welsh folklore. It does not apply today. Please, please, please do not try this at home. Even if you have twins and you think one is possessed by Pazuzu and the other by some other terrible demonic by Damien, by Damien from the Omen. Even if they're possessed by Pazuzu and Damien, do not try this at home. Anyway, back to the tale. And the witch tells the mother that she should go to a small wooden bridge not far away with one of the strange children under each arm. And I'm imagining this as a bit like carrying a rugby ball under your arm, which of course is the national sport of Wales. Well, symbolically at least. Anyway, let's not get into that right now. But it's a bit like carrying a rugby ball, although two rugby balls, one under each arm, which would technically be breaking the rules, but it doesn't matter because they're not rugby balls. They are potentially demonic children or, or fairy children or, or changeling children or whatever the heck they might be. But anyway, you carry these rugby ball babies to the bridge and there drop them from the bridge, drop them from the bridge and into the river beneath. And I don't want to repeat myself too much on this episode, but these instructions do bear repeating quickly. Go to a small wooden bridge that isn't far away with one of the strange children under each arm. Drop them, drop them from the bridge into the river beneath. Which is certainly one way to teach very young children not to show off by composing rhyming verses well beyond their years 
and doing it in time with their siblings. So, what happens next? This woman has been given this advice, which frankly is slightly bonkers and slightly dangerous, well, more than dangerous, slightly lethal. Well, the mother went back home and did as she had been directed. Yes, she did as she was told. And I love the fact that the original tale then skips ahead. It jumps past the most pivotal scene in this entire story. Nothing is said about what actually happens. Rather, it just says she did as she was told, and then she arrives back home again afterwards. Maybe it's best that that grisly scene is left to our imaginations. But she arrived back home again afterwards, empty-handed, it should be said. No rugby balls under her arms this time. But when she arrived back home, when she reached her doorstep, to her astonishment, she found that her children had been brought back. There they were. Now, this tale shares similarities with many other accounts of changelings, including a similar tale I spoke about back on episode 88. And in that tale, in which a mother also attempts to discover if her children are secretly changelings by throwing them into water. In that tale, she claims to see the, the goblins, as they're described, saving their offspring. And there's an important word there, their offspring. Not her offspring, but theirs. And they save them from this watery grave they are destined for. In this tale, she does not see anyone saving them. She just walks home and finds them waiting. But we can assume that somebody or something did indeed save them because they are they are clearly safe and well and no worse for wear for being thrown off the bridge. And the implication here is that some supernatural force is at work, which is presumably the changelings. Now, I suggested that you should never try this technique at home for, for obvious reasons, really. As I said, it is very old Welsh folklore. But the folklorist who recorded this back in the day did realise that maybe it wasn't a great idea even then. And does say, to quote, subjecting peevish children to such a terrible ordeal as this must have ended often with a tragedy. And I do like the use of the word often there. I would say maybe it always ended in tragedy. There aren't many cases I wouldn't have thought where throwing babies off bridges into rivers ends well, but let's let's go with it. Subjecting peevish children to such a terrible ordeal as this must have ended often with a tragedy, but they continue, even in such cases, superstitious mothers could easily persuade themselves that the destroyed infants were undoubtedly the offspring of elfins, so the offspring of elves, and therefore unworthy of their fostering care. So what we're being told is that it's a bit like Duncan a witch, where the poor suspected witch was either killed by drowning, in which case they were innocent, or if they survived, they were guilty, in which case they died anyway, and it was a lose-lose situation. And it's a similar thing here, we are told, with the children. Because if they survive, well... Of course they survived, <laughs> they're changelings. Some magical power intervened to help them survive. And if they died, well, they were probably changelings anyway. There's no need for the mother or the parents, but as you've probably gathered from these tales, it is always the mother faced with doing these terrible tasks. There is no need for them to feel guilty. It was never a real baby in the first place. Case solved, close the book, job done. Although we are told there is one way of escape for these children, which is to quote the only safeguard to wholesale infanticide. And I've said it before and I'll say it again, but the choice of words, the language used by some of these folklorists never ceases to amaze me at times. The only safeguard to wholesale infanticide was the test applied as to the superhuman precociousness or ordinary intelligence of the children. So basically, if your child is very clever and starts spouting off this verse well beyond their years, like in the last tale, then it's probably a changeling. But 
If your child is a bit stupid, then it's probably yours. So folklore is basically telling us that the more intelligent your child is, the less likely it is that it's really yours. Make of that what you will. Now, to back up some of that theory that you've just heard, if that's not too academic a word for some of the, what, what, what some people might describe as nonsense that you've just heard, but to back up some of this theory, we do have an other tale, which comes to us from Flan Vurog. In fact, the place name is in the title of the story. It is known as the Flan Vurog Changeling Legend, which was recorded by the Reverend Griffiths, who lived in a rectory in Ruthin, so we're staying in the north of Wales, but he was himself told this tale by an aged farmer called Evan Roberts from Llan Vurog, hence the name of the tale. And Roberts tells us that, or rather Roberts told the Reverend Griffiths, who tells us that a mother took her child to the gleaning field and left it sleeping under the sheaves of wheat whilst she was busy engaged gleaning. She was in the gleaning field gleaning, and if you're wondering what gleaning might mean, it is the act of collecting leftover crops from farmers' fields after they have been commercially harvested. And certainly back in the 1800s, which is when this tale dates from, it was quite a thankless job, quite a difficult job, almost literally backbreaking. The people that you see doing this, and again, it is almost certainly the women doing this job, are bent in two. They are bent double. And if you do an internet image search for this, you'll probably find a lot of romantic images, romantic paintings that depict these people as having the time of their lives working out in the sunshine. But in reality, it was far from romantic. But nobody is listening to this podcast to learn about agricultural processes or even art history. So back to the fairies. And talking about fairies, it was the fairies, the Tulloth Tig, who came to this gleaning field while the mother was busy gleaning and carried off. They stole her pretty baby when her back was turned, maybe her back was bent. And in its place, in the place of this child, they left one of their own infants. And at the time, the mother did not notice any difference between her own child and the one that took its place. They looked identical at that age, but after a while, she observed with grief that the baby she was nursing did not thrive. It did not grow, nor would it try to walk, which might sound like a lazy teenager, but this is a baby, and of course, babies do like walking and thriving and doing stuff. And she mentioned these facts to her neighbours. And rather than suggesting, again, like a normal doctor might do, is there something wrong with it? Does it have a temperature? Has it caught some terrible disease? She is told to do something strange and then listen to its conversation. So, very similar tale up to this point. We've got the same advice, but not from the mouth of a witch, but rather from her neighbours. And she is told to do something strange. And no, she does not run around painted blue screaming and throwing cake at the wall. She does something else that is very strange. And I am sure you are already one step ahead of me after listening to the last tale. And she decides to go back home, takes an eggshell and pretends to brew beer in it in front of the child. And she was surprised to hear that child who had observed her actions intently say aloud and i will read this in welsh first as the child is said to have spoken it and then i'll repeat it in english and it goes like this me welais vesen gan verwen me welais oi gan ya on ni welais yerioid verslau moon kibin oi ya which means and i'm sure you already know again where this is going I have seen an oak having an acorn. I have seen a hen having an egg, but never before saw brewing in the shell of a hen's egg. And as you probably also remember, because I only spoke about it a few minutes ago, children who speak in such fluent verse 
are seen as being slightly strange. And suspicion begins to turn to certainty. This woman now has the proof, as far as she is concerned, that this is not her child. And in the last account, that meant the children were heading for a rather dangerous swim off the nearest bridge. In this tale, the ending is slightly more ambiguous. The last one was quite vague. We don't get any details of what actually happens. But in this tale, we are simply told that this conversation, this verse spouted out by a young child, proved the origin of the precocious infant who lay in the cradle. This stanza was proof of their guilt. And every word of it, we are assured, came to us word by word from the mouth of Roberts. Which, as far as the Reverend was concerned and everyone else in the area, it would seem that was all the proof they needed. But he could not say what was done to it afterwards, what fate it met. So either he really didn't know, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe Roberts did not know what happened to that suspected fairy changeling. Or maybe he did know, and he didn't want to speak of its horrible fate. And once again, maybe it's best that we leave our own imaginations take over at this point. Now, both of these tales are very similar, presumably derived from the same source, and they both help us to identify a changeling, albeit using an extremely dangerous method. Again, don't try this at home. But... What about getting your own child back? So far, we've worked out how to identify if the changeling isn't yours, but how do you actually swap them? Well, to wrap up this episode, let us turn to our friends in Ireland. Let us head over to the Emerald Isle, where the Irish have a plan for reclaiming the child or the children carried away by the fairies because we are told the original child or the human child I guess you would call it the stolen child that was replaced by a changeling was placed at the top of a dung hill which isn't what most people expect in these tales you might think the fairies might go and put them on top of a hill made of gold coins and jewels and anything the heart might desire a pile of cake but no on top of a dung hill a hill made of dung, which, let's be honest, is not somewhere you'd want to stay for too long. And you would hope your parents or your mother, as it seems to be in this case, would do everything possible to get you back. And to do this, people could chant invocatory lines beseeching the fairies to restore the stolen child. Just go to a dunghill and plead with the little folk to give them back. Now, that was the case in Ireland. At least, that's what our intrepid folklorist on this episode tells us, at least. And they also note that there was a similar belief in Wales. A certain form of incantation, it's like spellcasting, incantation to reclaim children from the fairies, which was as follows. The mother who had lost her child, was to carry the changeling to a river. But she was to be accompanied by a conjurer, who was to take a prominent part in the ceremony. So we've still got going to the river with your baby, but there's an extra step here. You need to take someone magical. And when at the river's brink, the conjurer was to cry out, out and again i will do this in the original welsh language first and then translate crap ararach a grip on the hag after which the mother was to respond with re hoir gavraglach to a late decrepit one and having uttered these words she was to throw the child into the stream and to depart and it was believed that on reaching her home she would there find her own child safe and sound again this is quite a high risk thing to attempt but at least this time there's one extra step you need to find that magical partner to come with you but at least this time not only are you throwing a child into the water you should be 
receiving yours back in return. So that is how you do it correctly. But of course, for the last time on this episode, don't ever try it out at home. And on that cautionary note, so ends another episode of the Ghosts and Folklore podcast. And if you've enjoyed this episode and you haven't already, please consider hitting the subscribe button. And also, if you are a new listener, as mentioned, the last Changeling episode was episode 88, if you did want to go back and check that one out afterwards. And if you really enjoyed this podcast and you'd like to support it, you can treat me to a coffee via my website, which is always greatly appreciated. Or you could just leave a nice review or a nice rating or tell all your friends about it, whatever you'd like to do. And if you'd like more ghosts and folklore, you can follow me on social media. And as well as this podcast, I've also written several books about similar weird and wonderful subjects, which are available from all good bookshops offline and on. Just search my name, search for Mark Reese, and you will find them all. And on that note, it just leaves me to say thank you very much for listening. Dioch and Varian Amrando. I've been Mark Reese. This has been my Ghosts and Folklore podcast, beaming to you from Wales to the world. And remember, the next time somebody asks you to do something strange, there is nothing wrong with painting your entire body blue, running around the house screaming and throwing cake at the walls. Until next time. No star.